so I would like to welcome everyone to our third Saul Speaker Series, and I am so excited to have Diana Phillips here. I heard her speak at the Starfleet VIC conference uh, last year, and I just love your talks. I learned so much, and they're very inspiring, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, as I was going through uh, Dinah's bio, um, she's done so much in her career. Um, just a few highlights. Uh, she's provided more than 25 years of presentations and workshops at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, trained over 20,000 educators uh, during her illustrious career. Um, in February 2021, she was selected as a member of the Elite SEEC crew team at the Johnson Space Center's Space Exploration Educators Conference. In February 23, she was awarded the Sherry Brindley Outstanding Educator Award for Outstanding Contributions to Space Education at the Johnson Space Center. The first recipient of the Indigenous Stardust Festival 23 Legacy Award and is recognized a DKG International and ISF speaker, among many other things. So I'm very, very uh, happy to welcome you uh, to our Cell Speaker Series, Diana. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to share your uh, immense knowledge with us and um, talk about food tonight. <laughs> it's always a great topic to talk about food. <laughs> we can't go wrong with that. <laughs> All righty. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. I've been looking forward to this. Barb and I share um, a lot of passion for food and food growth. And the way that this talk is put together is for us to see not just you know what's necessary to sustain us in the future on other planets um, but also what we need to do here on earth and how we are getting uh, children started with the understanding that they need to play a really important role in this exploration and understanding for their future because we are handing them a planet that has a few deficits. So here we go. Um, so just a little bit about me, other all the things that Barb said, fantastic. Barb, thank you so much for your introduction again. Um, I'm considered a multi-platform educator because there are a lot of different things that I do. And um, I really love uh, life and all the aspects that come with the journey that I've been on. And it has been a very, very interesting journey. I am not reading this list to you. So go right ahead. Uh, and you go, you can read that for yourselves. So something happened in terms of my education. So I was that that little girl who used to stare at the sky and stare at the stars, and very much wanted to know what was up there, and what was going on. And that was what I thought was where I wanted to be. I wanted to be pilot. But unfortunately, back in the 60s and 70s, we were always being told that girls don't fly planes. Now, that would be a different story today, for sure. However, I have spent most of my life not just teaching uh, English and French in classrooms, but when the trajectory shifted for me, which you'll see in the presentation, um, I moved back into this field of aerospace and aerospace education, science and STEM and STEAM. So um, something happened on the way to school. And what happened was I had the opportunity to be sent to Space Camp Alabama. And when I was sent to Space Camp, Camp Alabama, one of the things that was offered to the educators that year, it was the year of Katrina. Um, I remember that because some of the people in the pictures are actually uh, teachers who had lost their schools and, and many other things that year. But um, we were offered the opportunity to fly zero G. That was 
really an important shift for me in my life. I'd always been a hands-on educator. I never uh, was that teacher who said, turn to page 25, or, you know, or look at 35 and your answer's on the back on 42. It was really about exploring and being hands-on. I also come from a bit of an arts background because I had such a passion for the arts. So to, for me to build hands-on into my teaching was critical. And going to Space Camp Alabama just reinforced the fact that if we could build STEM into every subject area, how much better would it be for our learners? How much more engaged would they be? And I don't know how many of you were sort of those people that coasted through school or loved school, but I was that kid who I just couldn't wait to get out of school. So in kindergarten, I actually learned how to tell time because I knew when I could go home. Kind of sad, but true. So we have to understand how space relates in education. And there are all the components of the content areas. In this particular slide, you'll see all of the ones that we're familiar with. And the one that's missing, of course, is the arts here. And the arts, is, there's been a really strong focus on making sure that we have STEAM education. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and that they combine. None of these are separate. They are all foundations of each other, which is what's exciting for education. So I love teaching. I love the inquiry method of STEM and also STEAM. And in my journeys, I've had the opportunity to be educated. Again, math and language arts teacher, um, not a science teacher. So I had to go to my schooling. I had to go to places where I could get education. And I'm thankful for people like my former school board, Lester McPherson School Board, as well as the Cosmodome in Laval and the Canadian Space Agency who offered me opportunities to sit with astronauts ask questions and then be able to train myself as well as train other teachers. So this is pretty much what my life has been looking like for over 27 or eight years now. Science Yourself is the um, program that I put together. Um, and this program is something that is offering opportunities from NASA and other organizations that children can get in my own office space in Point Claire, uh, in Montreal here where I am, but it also allows me to take it not just to classrooms here in Quebec, but also globally. We get to explore, we get to try out and field test NASA programs, and that's exciting. They're not, there's nothing else like that going on here in Quebec. We're one of a kind. We have STEM genuity and STEM genuity is just for girls because being that girl that was denied the opportunity to be able to go into uh, the either the Air Force or to be able to fly airplanes, I really wanted girls to know that you have a place and you belong there. They were even coming out when COVID was on um, because we gave them the opportunities as long as they were within the safety parameters. And we found exciting things happening with the girls. The girls, A, not only were they thankful that they had an opportunity to do things on their own, but B, the opportunity to not have to be in a classroom where they were in competition with everybody. Science Yourself is called Science Yourself because everybody gets their own equipment. And that is the way in which this program has thrived. In schools, we often have to share. Nothing wrong with that. But when we have an opportunity to just get our own materials and explore, fantastic, because great things come out. There's still a lot of dialogue, don't get me wrong. And there's an awful lot of, you know, just putting minds together and collaborating because it's important that they learn that great ideas are meant to be shared and the sparks that come off of that can create something wonderful. So you're familiar with this. And William Shatner, he's done some amazing things in his life, far more amazing than mine. But that wonderful statement that came out of, you know, space, the final frontier. Well, we realize there is no final frontier. 
we are moving somewhere beyond the limits and we're excited for that. So we're going where we feel that no one else has gone before. So how are we going to get everybody ready for this? Well, if we take a look at the Star Trek T TNG era, you know, there are episodes that show, and very few, by the way, um, this teacher, Miss Gladstone, who was in two episodes called The Child, and there was also, well, Lieutenant Vlad Ballard, I'm sorry, uh, from the episode three. And they really were not that great at teaching the kids. And in fact, there are references to the slower learners not being satisfactory for future jobs and careers. Well, we're different and we try to find ways to help children learn and the first place we need to go is to our earthling educators. When they have more, the students get more. So even though it wasn't a good record, you know, ultimately we know that on earth, we have to do things differently and, and we are. So I often get asked this question, why on earth do we spend so much money to go to space? Well, this is a fairly old chart, and I can tell you that this is probably exemplified by 25 by now. But we go to space because everything that's spent there helps us here on Earth. And that is the true justification for space exploration, other than just wanting to be pioneers, which we inherently are. But the things that we're benefiting from, and even have yet to be invented, are all things that are being investigated for space right now. So more benefits will come our way. And yes, we're going. And it's time to get our students ready. And NASA has made the commitments to send humans to Mars by 2030s. Um, we're semi on track, I believe. And it's an opportunity for our young people to understand not just that NASA has a role, the global world has a role, but also Canada has a role in this as well. So we're raising the Artemis generation, folks, and you're part of that. If you've got kids and grandchildren right now, they are part of this Artemis generation. So it's time for us to get them ready for exploration. The Artemis crew with Canada on board, so exciting <clears throat> to have our wonderful Jeremy Hansen on board for this mission. It is exciting for us because it's not a common mission to be able to move on a trajectory and orbit the moon by a Canadian is unheard of. So this is really, really an opportunity that we want our kids involved in. He is moonbound and we're excited about that. If you haven't been able to see the Artemis II chart that allows you to understand the flight patterns and how they will orbit the moon, um, definitely check online. It is there in multitudes. There's all kinds of images uh, available, but check on the NASA website for one of the most or the better ones. And it is laid out very, very clearly as to how this is this whole incredible uh, rockets going to do its job and then allow Orion to follow the trajectory and orbit the moon. It's very, very exciting from start to finish. But folks, we only have one Earth, one. So it is very exciting to go to space and we will continue to do so for our benefit. And so when we think about our Star Trek characters and the types of food that they ate, and if you want to go right ahead, throw some of the food names that you know from any of the episodes that you've ever seen, go ahead and do that. Um, they were able to do food re replication. Well, we're actually looking for ways to do food replication. So I say, yet. We 
here in Quebec, the students who are working with Science Yourself, no geez about it, were driven to look beyond the horizons. The planetary concerns for our universe are heightened right now. We need to be concerned. But as I tell the students, don't be so concerned that you're so frightened that you move into the, well, I can't do anything about it pattern. We need to be able to know that, yes, we can be part of something that's going to be life-changing for all of us. So generating three centimeters of topsoil takes a thousand years. Do we have a thousand years more? Yes, we hope so. Um, degradation continues all the time. About a third of all the world's, world's soil has already been degraded. And that alone is a concern. And the World uh, Soil Society is helping us understand to get the message out to children to think about planting for eating purposes, but also for the pleasure. And, and I'm going to address that in a little bit. So when we talk about Star Trek's versions of food and those food replicators, we've seen the food on, online, we've seen the videos, we've seen the TV shows and so on. Um, yes, nothing ever really looked that exciting and or tasty. And in fact, the names are all names we normally do not understand. But with food insecurity right now, we know that we have to figure this out. We need to figure it out for space exploration because when they do travel further out and go to the moon or to Mars and so on, then how are we gonna feed our astronauts? How are they going to be you know, providing gardens and greenhouses and sustainability for themselves? And again, what we learned there helps us here. So, Solving food insecurities is important in both ways. And replicators, let's have a look in a moment about that. So are you familiar with the gawk, the Klingon gawk? The Klingon gawk is something that was served up, but I can tell you right now that Klingon gawk was not a favorite to anyone because it's mostly worms. And by the way, um, the food that was served on any of the episodes was actually never even eaten by any of the actors and actresses. They did not eat the food. So if you think about it, Star Trek characters, they had really fancy diets. And I love the way they served the food. It was some of the classiest things we saw in, in the era. And maybe it had something to do with the way that all of us were being raised even on earth, the fancy dishes and the silver trays and so on, which we don't seem to see too much of anymore. Um, taking a look at some of the foods and things that were, were being eaten, like the plomique soup, well, stable for Vulcans, but what was it, <laughs> right? What was really in that? Um, so when we talk about food for space, we're talking about thermal stabilized foods, we're talking about foods that are pre-packaged, freeze-dried. Um, food is not just meant for nutrition, by the way, but food is also, you know, to help the, op the optimal performances of the astronauts. It's important that they stay healthy and they also need to like what they eat. So they do have some choices about that. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but food doesn't have taste when you're in space. So what do you like to put on your food when it doesn't have any taste on it? Um, how many of you are ketchup fans? Go ahead, throw your hand up. It's ketchup for me. How many of you are salt fans? Throw your hand up, All right? And anything that we can think of to make food better, we put on there. So when we're talking about food that's gonna taste good for astronauts, they actually have some preferences. But the number one preference is anything with chili or hot sauces to activate the taste buds in their mouth. Now, we're looking at a picture of um, the astronaut in, its, in their normal state and then also when they're in space. And when they're in space, they, have, they go through something called 
puffy face and chicken legs. So um, their blood and is rushing upwards all the time because they're constantly battling this microgravity environment and their legs become thinner, the chests get moved upward and the faces get puffy. So if you put two pictures side by side of before and after, while they are actually on the space station, you're gonna see how, how big they are. So think about that for a minute. Their olfac olfactory nerves, the nose, the, the ears, the mouth, the taste buds, everything is affected and therefore food and doesn't taste good and doesn't really have much of a smell or smell good. So we're looking for ways to feed our astronauts with food choices that have a little bit more of an exciting taste. This is this an exciting taste? So could insects be suitable food during long-term space travel? Is it possible that uh, the Star Trek era influenced this? So insects have been considered because they are nutritionally suitable and on earth, we already know there are countries that are eating insects and they're becoming more and more popular. I remember just recently being in the States and going into a candy store and there are lollipops with grasshoppers in them. Pretty exciting for some people, not quite for me though. So insects produce more food per feed and they are often compared to traditional livestock animals. They're also small. So if we think about taking things up into space, that's a tiny food source compared to anything else we might be able to send up. So do astronauts go to the store to shop? What do you think? Give me a thumbs up and you can open your mic and say, yes, they do. No, they don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of no's right now. Um, yeah, actually they do. <laughs> they do. They have to pick out food that they like. It doesn't mean that it's going to be going up into the International Space Station in the packages that they're, they're looking at at the store right now. But they do get their choices of foods. So for example, today there was the, the launch CRS uh, SpaceX. It, it's a, the Dragon resupply ship it took up some of the things that they like. So there were actually cookie choices for them that were sent up. So we do let them go to the store, but most food is done right here. So no grocery store, no problem. We can go to the food lab and we can watch and work with our senior research scientists who are preparing food in the systems laboratory. So, they are working on a number of things, tasting, testing for packaging, things have to be small, um, ready to eat meals, things that are going to last over time and not um, become bad or poor to eat over time too early. So the heat stabilized food is really critical, food in pouches and freeze dried is important for our space travelers right now. How many of you remember this? Tang. <laughs> yeah, see a lot of excitement. There are great commercials, by the way. Um, and I love, I really enjoyed the, the Tang drinks and being able to put them into popsicles when I was little, but NASA didn't make Tang, all right? Tang was made by General Foods. But what they did was they made it cool because the astronauts, Mercury astro astronauts were drinking this. So suddenly now the excitement about Tang started to spread across the United States and then, then the world. And Tang is still one of the drinks used today. So commercially available beverage packages, uh, that powders that are in small packages that allow them to be able to drink Cookies, candies, other dried things, zero gravity cups, very interesting concept. Um, they created a couple of years back a cup that could be used rather than having to always drink out of these packages with spigots like Leland Melvin is doing here. And um, 
I'm not sure how successful that was, but when you look at it, it almost looks like your mother's uh, gravy dish. That is the, the shape of it so that everything sits in the base of the cup and there's no handle, just round your hand around it and you pour it into your mouth like so. So maybe that's what they would consider some of the more fancier dishes. Um, here from the Mercury era right there, there's turkey and gravy. That is a day meal that is in there. Um, it's actually, sorry, from the Skylab. Now, when you think about opening up tuna right now, okay? So same idea here, but there's probably a longer life on some of their tins than ours. I have yet to open up a tin like this. I have myself packages of uh, fl flown space food. I will never open them um, because they are not looking very exciting. I can tell you that. And the worst one that I have ever seen is actually the scrambled eggs. Folks, that just looks like barf in a bag. Sorry to say that, but that's the reality of it. Have a look at the way that they get to eat. So we sit at the table. They have a table too. Their table gets strapped to their lap. And everything they need is Velcroed down. Now, I, I have to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. We always tell our kids, don't play with food, right? How many of you heard that when you were younger? Don't play with your food. Well, astronauts play with their food and darn, it's fun. We also played with our food while we were on zero gravity. So anything like small, the fish chip cookies, the um, Smarties, things like that. That's an amazing thing to actually watch free fall through space, have your mouth open and then catch it. Same thing with the water. But you don't want your fork, knife, and spoon and take a look at those scissor-like contraptions there. You don't want those things floating around. So it's important that they strap it onto their leg and then everything else is now Velcroed down. Of course, things have to be warmed up. They're warming systems. There's no microwaves. Therefore, you cannot make popcorn in space yet. I've challenged some children to figure that one out. But, you know, prepackaged food is never that exciting. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to feed our astronauts. So how are we getting our kids ready? How are we doing that? Well, with science yourself, no geez about it. We became the first Canadian leguminots with Magnitude Point IO. There are no other Canadians doing this. Sadly, what is the Canadian Leguminot and Magnitude Point IO? Magnitude Point IO is an organization that has allowed teachers to investigate crop growth, looking at becoming carbon farmers, and at the same time, having the capacity to be able to communicate with the International Space Station through the ExoLab. We'll see that in a second. So the ExoLab is a literally a box that contains two tubes inside. The students put their seeds of choice. And usually in the beginning, we were all sort of using the same seeds, same legume. And what we did was we put it in our agar. And the picture that you're looking at right now is the actual a plant that was growing on the International Space Station at the time when we started during the months of COVID. Now in the classroom, we also have our plants that are growing at the same time simultaneously as the ones that are on the ISS. Take a look at the girl on the screen. She came in for one day as a friend uh, to one of the children who was in our program. She was absolutely enthralled and engaged and went home and created even more plants in her home. And that's what we want. We want children to know that plants are important for a number of reasons. So we're creating our generation space farmers. The students, some of them were six years old, working 
with petri dishes and agar and test tubes and they were um, sterilizing plants. That's exciting. If we can offer opportunities like that to young children, we might actually have more farmers, more space farmers, more children interested in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. This is the this is one of the plants, not ours actually, it's not a magnitude plant, that uh, is just literally free falling in space because it was an opportunity to show some of the other types of plants that were growing on the ISS. So, so why do students need to study this fruit crop production for space? Well, we require energy from food. That's important. We have to combat uh, malnutrition with nutrient dense food, not the junky stuff that most of us are getting our hands on right now or nutrient completely abandoned nutrient foods where there's really nothing in it. Breakdown of nutrients in aged prepackaged food currently made for astronauts, uh, they really have to have more choices as well. And then the difficulty in transporting animals for food has to told us already, you have to look at things like insects and or being able to grow plants that we can not only eat, but we can keep regenerating more plants from them through their seeds. So resupply missions, especially for Mars, are not going to be feasible for long-term and long-term missions. I mean, it's been said, if we go to Mars, we're not coming back. So everything has to be developed for space. This is a fantastic program here. It's been in development and, and available to teachers for many, 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 many years. Tomato Sphere is one of the best programs ever. Dr. Bob Thirst, Canadian astronaut, is one of the creators of Tomato Sphere. And this is where seeds have been literally planted on the ISS. They are growing into tomatoes. The tomato seeds are then brought back and they are put through a process where they are freeze dried and then we have the opportunity to grow them again in our classrooms. And often we don't know which seeds we have because there's a bit of a comparison uh, package that you get. If you get an A and a B, then we know that some were grown on space and some were grown on earth, but we don't know which ones. So there's a whole process of while we're doing the investigation, you have to record what's going on, um, what are the findings. So that makes kids researchers at a very young age. So the process for this whole um, uh, tomato sphere is, you know, we've got 1.2 million tomato seeds that are prepared to be sent to space. So it starts with that. Then the seeds travel to space in the belly of a dragon, SpaceX uh, spaceship, and then it's transported to the International Space Station. The tomato seeds spend about four weeks in space and then they come back down to earth. And across Canada and the United States, students then begin the planting with Let's Talk Science, incredible organization. And by the way, nonprofit, free for all kids in classrooms. So we've got this. Um, you're looking at the team that is powered by Curiosity. We're only a few global members there represented by the states. Um, we also have Africa, we have Germany in that picture, Canada, and there are far more of us. I can't even begin to tell you how many there are. But right there is a good look at the ExoLab. All right. And when kids have the opportunity to watch their plants grow, not just in their own little earth pods, but also in the ExoLab, I can tell you every classroom that has this going on or in our programs, the first place they go when they enter the room is to check on the plants. They love this. It's like raising their own kids. It's pretty exciting for them. So we wanna boldly go and boldly germinate legume plants and fix nitrogen and create nodules. Our mission is to create nodules. So the legumes that are the family of plants that serve a significant source of our dietary protein fiber and other essential nutrients, we need to get nodules from them. 
they also obtain nitrogen. So through a specialized process known as nodulation, we absolutely have a symbiotic partnership in which the soil bacteria um, infects the root of the plant from bulb-like nodules. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't get to do this stuff when I was in school. So I'm really glad we're able to offer this to young children today. I mean, when we're talking about converting nitrogen to kids in grade one, not only is their first thing that they say, I know what nitrogen is, because you know they know everything these days, thanks to the internet, but they want to get involved in this. So understanding how modulation goes is really important. So we have all ages doing this. We've got them in homes. We've got them in schools. We've got them in our program, uh, which is a, a nonprofit program. They are so invested in figuring out how we're going to eat now, in the future, but possibly even help countries that are struggling right now. So the ExoLab mission, Food for Earth, this could possibly be our new age food replicator. We'll figure it out. We're getting ready to go again this fall to send our plants back up and also to watch some seed growth happen. We're hoping for some success. We haven't been terribly successful with our onboard uh, agars um, and moisture. And sometimes what happens is there is a delay. So, and that happens with all kinds of missions. So we've got everything in storage, it's ready to go, but then there's a delay in the actual liftoff. And so that means now they're sitting in conditions that are not optimal for these plants. So we're finding out that if we can get them there without any big delays, we may have a better chance. And we're also looking at different types of medium to use. So we've had, you know, some achievements. It's achieved real world education and research. And that's exciting and fun. And we have partnerships with the ISS National Lab and SpaceX resupply missions. Not too many kids get to say, I've got a plant that's going up on SpaceX. That's really out of this world thinking. So Science Yourself, No G's About It offers STEM and STEAM education to everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, adults, children, grandchildren, you name it. Uh, they are doing things like nanoscience. This is nanoscience. How do we understand small particles and their behavior? Well, seeds are small particles when you think about that too. They're not minimal, but they are important in our investigations. I also take this program out to Metagamy and Timmins, Ontario, because these are areas where there's no access to not only materials, but funding to be able to look at space and space education. We revolutionize education in Space for Earth and beyond the Trek classroom by providing them, A, with opportunities to learn our history in Canada and our investment in space. I like to tell kids they own the Canada arm, we pay our tax dollars, so therefore you own it. And they get pretty excited about that. So the girls that are on the far side over there, they are actually testing a boom, which is mimicking the, the reaction and behavior of the International Space Station's Canada. We're doing things like medical emergencies, all right? Again, young kids at camp, we looked at holograms, why? Because medical emergencies, when we go to space, somebody gets sick on food, how are we gonna handle that? We need this. So NASA flight surgeon, Dr. Joseph Schmidt, he actually holoported October, 2021 and visited on board the International Space Station. Now he worked on, on from his site where he was holoporting from with his team and astronaut Thomas Pesquet was on board. And they were testing out movements, interactions for surgical procedures. The Lunar Gateway is a Canadian contribution. How are we going to understand its role in the future? So although it's built with international partners, 
we have to be able to know again, not only our history, but our contribution, but at the same time, how will this serve us when we start thinking about farming in the future? So if they cannot get STEM and STEAM in their schools, we'll bring it to them. So we want that word to get out, to be able to let them explore. This is a group of high school students. Now, high schoolers are some of the toughest people on the planet, right? They never want to admit they're having fun <laughs> or that they're engaged or motivated. And look at these faces, look at the interactions. So we continually look for ways to bring them on board and get them inspired. Doesn't mean you're going to be an astronaut. That's something we make very, very clear because there are far too many jobs available in aerospace and aviation. You don't just have to be the astronaut. So STEAM is the way forward. And we look at science through artistic lenses as well. So take a look at the two suits that are there. Is actually part of the Space for Art Foundation suits, Unity, Hope, and Courage. And these suits are literally swatches of painted cloth. And one of the groups that participated in making these suits are children from the Montreal Children's Hospital in the cancer ward. Even children who have challenges can be part of the missions and interest in education, space education. So Artemis and we're going to the moon and beyond. How can we explore it? We use activities to get them excited about that. Out of this world professional development, if you've never heard of the SEEC, SEEK Conference, Space Exploration Educators Conference. This is a conference where hundreds of teachers come. They come for training, they come to give workshops, they come to meet some of the finest organizations, including NASA, and we leave with swag bags that actually cause many of us to buy extra suitcases to go home. But that's what helps support our classrooms. So I've been providing, as Barb mentioned earlier, uh, for many years workshops and I continue to do so. Working at camps in and around Montreal is important. Camps don't necessarily have aerospace programs. So this is a chance too for us to not just get these parts of the sciences out, but also the planting and understanding the food growth. If we take a look at the two boys in the first part and the first picture in the blue shirts, they're actually mining on Mars. They have a pan that's filled with not only Mars simulant, Earth, and all kinds of magnetic and non-magnetic items. And then they've got a magnetic wand and they are searching to see what is in the environment. The next discussion they will have is if they have to put a plant in there, is this a viable way to do it? Is the stuff in the pan, which is made up of all sorts of things, going to help or hinder the growth of their plants. And of course, the lander in the middle, because we've got to get there first. And then lots of math and science without them even realizing they're doing it. Astronomy presentations are really important for us too. So we bring in um, a local astronomer and his name is Trevor Kavordian. He's from Astro, um, Plato Astro. And he paid a visit to our group and that allows us to bring it up a notch in areas that perhaps myself and some of my animators are not as skilled in. NASA Sparks is a program that was field tested by us. It was being field tested with people from other parts of the world. Students got to see students building rockets and we built um, the uh, Artemis rockets approximately five to six feet tall, every child left with one. And I want to tell you the funniest thing to see is a group of children who are shorter than a rocket, trying to walk down a set of stairs and refusing to let their parents even touch it. <laughs> it was quite exciting. The Edge of Galaxy, Malaysia, Brazil, Mexico, USA, and Canada 
opportunities to work with children in those areas too. So we reach out and we are often invited to be part of some of the growth that's happening around the world. Again, the exploration Kells Camp Academy, launching rockets, learning fluid dynamics. Look at the age group there. They're young, they're engaged. McGill University uh, visits us at the Montreal Aviation Museum where I am the, uh, at the education consultant. And they, these students came from Mexico. They were also building landers and testing them out and we practically could not get them to leave. They were over the age of 18, some of them. And they were excited because they'd never done anything like this. This is about having an inspiration nation. Providing teacher training is key, it's key. Um, so we do have a conference here in Montreal as well. It's called QPAC, every year in the fall it's held and teachers come in droves and they have this yearning to know more about how can they bring space into the classroom. So on uh, the past two, three years now, myself and my partner have been offering education opportunities the one in the middle was actually just recent. So that was this February. And we are landing a, an asteroid on a target because we all know there's a lot of that happening right now as well. And of course, down below, Chris Hatfield is a frequent visitor and a fantastic human being to tap into for information. So getting ready for the future now. We are going to grow plants. We are preparing to build an analog mission in Timmins, Ontario. Jason Michaud is the CEO of Stardust Technologies, and he is the dreamer, the believer, and the committed to this program. And I will be one of the first people to do the biological lab and take care of the plant studies in it. Although we're aiming to do this in winter time, <laughs> I'm trying to be really brave about that we will be mimicking life on Mars. So you'll hear more about that. We will also work with an, an, ortho, an orthocytes because we really want to understand what types of rocks are on the moon. And these are actually very similar to moon rocks. So we will be working with that. And these are all found in Timmins, Ontario. So we'll be doing a lot of research for education and we'll be bringing that to our children. It's also our dream to hold an analog mission for young students. Perhaps the upper elementary, if you're in Ontario, middle school students, and anyone beyond that, that level. So we have already experienced isolation when we went through COVID. And not everybody did very well with that. So when we think about being isolated on Mars, feed ourselves through the green habitat, needs to be tested. How do we look after ourselves? And I should mention to you too, by the way, that because when we were um, looking after our plant growths and doing ExoLab during COVID, the children actually reported that they felt happy. So we know that plants do this for us already. If you are a plant lover and you've got them around your house, there's a reason for that. Yes, you're going to get more oxygen, and things like that, but there's a pleasure in this. And that and music combined actually helps to relax our astronauts in space. So we're going to have some VR conditioning, geological surveying, crew bonding experiments, um, and then we're going to be testing some encrypted messages because we need to act exactly like we're on Mars. Teacher professional development again, um, yeah, lots of it. And all ages of teachers, or I'm sorry, all ages of uh, students and grade levels that these teachers are coming from. And they come from all across Quebec for this conference. So that looks like a duplicate slide. And am I going backwards? Hold on a second. There's, whoops, there's a real possibility here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rio Tinto Planetarium. If you've never been to Montreal, come on over and see us over at the Rio Tinto Alpen Planetarium 2024. Uh, I believe it is on the 8th of June. 
We have the next uh, Planetarium Astro Fest. Really exciting times. They even have, they bring out the telescopes for night scopes. And we're allowed to take a look at the stars and the patterns during the day. They will take pictures of this, the sky and even they have the solar scopes. And Barb, if you're around, come on out. We want you. Um, this is what's happening right now for myself and John Abbott College. I was offered the opportunity to have the ISS Mimic brought to Canada. And this is a crazy amount of money. They offered it to my program for free. And these students are putting it together, testing it. We're almost there. The one in the middle is a finished one. It is not the one we are building. But currently, we have all visible parts and pieces that you're looking at right now ready to go. They're just troubleshooting. And within the next two weeks, we will have the ISS mimic up and running. It mimics the movement of the ISS at the same time that the ISS is moving. So when the solar panels move on the International Space Station, the mimics will move as well. Fantastic project, and I've never seen more dedicated young people in my life. Heading to Maine every year, uh, that's coming up in May, and that's an opportunity to be with some of my colleagues and again, train children of all ages. This year, we will be speaking to special needs groups and also special needs adults in a home program that will allow us to give them opportunities to explore as well. One of the bottom lines for doing this is jobs, 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 and more jobs. And there's jobs that will never even be seen yet because we don't know what they are, but they are coming. Opportunities. Never believed that I would be where I am in my lifetime to stand with people like Apollo astronaut Fred Hayes. And I love all of this for two reasons. One, because I can go back and take the stories to other people. And two, because I was that kid who was told I couldn't do things. And I look at these images and I think hard work pays off. Don't give up dreams, folks. Never, ever, ever. So follow your passions, whatever they are. And wherever you have the opportunity, inspire our youth. As much as we think that they're not listening or paying attention, they may not be looking at you, but they are. Come on out to the Angoka Festival in 2024. This is the former uh, Stardust Festival, and it's in being held again in Timmins, Ontario from May 27th to June 1st. Uh, we already have Dr. David Williams, uh, former astronaut, Canadian Space Agency, coming out, and a plethora of people from NASA and all reams of space life, uh, space um, Blue Origin, and several others will be coming out, Lockheed Martin, and so on. So I, I love this quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think of space not as the final frontier, but as the next frontier, not as something to be conquered, but to be explored. So I would take this a little bit further in my world with students, and that is explore here now, because this is the place to take care of. So yes, we need you. We need you to get involved, spread the word, Keep doing what you're doing with your program because it's exciting for one. And I'm going to close out and say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Thank you so very much, Diana. That was that was an awesome presentation. Lots of food for thought, so to speak. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Oh, that's good. So we have some time for questions. If anyone has a question, uh, please raise your hand, and um, we can uh, thank you pick her brain even further. Jenna, USS uh, Crewman. Uh, yes, um, I was curious. Um, you said something about. Um, 
how the food doesn't really look that good or anything like that. Um, does it taste good, even though it doesn't look good? So remember, they really don't have, taste buds are swelling in space. So the food taste has to have a little bit of help. So in some cases, it might be ketchup, it might be vinegar, it might whatever their preference is. So I would imagine like, it's going to taste good, but they have to eat. Right? Yeah. Um, and it's this is not like Mark Watley where we're going to have potatoes and only potatoes. Um, so it's important that, you know, the food looks appealing and, and more so now than it used to, by the way. I have to say there are some packages that's mashed peas. It looks like mashed peas. Um, but again, the taste is, it's, it's hard to define a taste because of the swelling okay. of the buds on the tongue and so on. But there are certain things they can taste. And so things, for example, today, the crew was being sent up um, citric fruits. So things that are citrus like can be tasted. So it just depends on what is it that is being sent to them and what their choices are as well. But you've probably at some point put something on your food to make it taste better. And that's common. That's common for yeah. them to do. And they may have already figured out, because I'm real, I'm not sure about that, but I would say they probably figured out which one works for each astronaut. Okay. So it is like you said, it is a preference for each yeah. each one. Um, a follow-up question. Um, you were talking about the 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 shape of the astronauts connected yes. to the, that. Um, I just saw a, a thing um, that um, uh, a diver went into the the ocean for a certain amount of days and um, in a capsule, of course, and it was something to do with his um, genes that age and keep him young. And um, when he came out, it was like he had more youth rather than aging. And so my question is, does that puffiness, does that alteration of the astronauts' bodies is does that have any alteration in their aging process? So you I know? I would I don't know how to answer that one completely. Um, but what I can tell you is we take a look at some of the existing Apollo astronauts that are still alive today. Again, they have regiments of exercise, having to stay healthy while on board the International Space Station. Um, they have to learn how to check their bloods and all of those things. They're taught literally how to medically care for themselves for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just, I'm going to reach up here for a second. Okay. You, and I wanted to grab that down before. I just put this here for a second and then I'll continue to talk to you. People like Chris Hadfield are physically healthy to look at. Do we know if there's anything wrong? We don't know. Do we know that, that astronauts have higher chances of cancer because of exposure to rays and things like that? Yes, we know that that happens, all right? But when we look at somebody who's been a moonwalker, who's still alive today, like Fred Hayes, he's an elderly person. He walks with um, a walker, but his mind is sometimes sharper than mine on a given day because he really has looked after himself. And so health is all about how we take care of ourselves. What do we eat? Do we exercise? And all of that. So that's only in part of what, uh, what I can answer. When we talk about the puffy face, all right? So this device here, all right, you may have seen some of those before. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hold it. I'm not squeezing it. I can't. It's glass. Okay, I'm just gonna wrap my hands around it. And while I'm doing that, I just want you to watch the top of it. Let me back up a little bit. So, so what's happening? What do you see is going on here? 
Um, I, I, my vision is kind of impaired. Does anybody else can, can somebody else see the difference? The fluid is changing. Oh, the going blue. from, yeah, the bottom is going into the top. Yeah. And you're just holding it. That's it. Just holding it. I won't let go because it is glass. Yeah. You can't squeeze it. It's impossible. So what this does is it's really mimicking the blood flow while we're in space. So it's okay. literally being pushed up. All right. All the time. So there's no gravity. So we have uh -huh. to counter that. And the way we counter that is by exercise. All right. So that it right. can start to go back down and adjust itself. Now, uh -huh. if you take a look at some of the landings in the past when, and probably even now, sometimes when they come back in the Russian, from the Russian uh, Soyuz launches and they've gone to the ISS and they're returning and they're landing back down in the, the landing capsules and so on. They're always being helped, right? To stand up and walk, move forward. So they're pretty weak. Mm -hmm. However, if you take a look at the astronauts that are traveling via the dragons, there's a big difference. Mm. They literally come out waving <laughs> okay. yeah. after landing. So, so there's something different going on that's going to, that's changing the way in which their bodies are reacting. Long-term space flight. Chris Hatfield was one of those people. David St. Jacques was one of those people. And these are healthy, productive people and will probably live a long, long time. Well, okay. Thank you for your questions, Tana. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. you. Any other questions? Anybody want to go back to school? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Darlene's like, yes. <laughs> I want to go buy some tang. <laughs> Take, uh, I drank a lot moment. of that in 2010 when I was up north in the Calvin Nunavut because mm. it was cheaper to buy the a tang to make up for my vitamin C than it was to buy the orange juice. Wow. So I can totally relate to that, Darlene, because I was living in Aupaluk and oh, okay. we had packages of soup and then packages of juice and stirring yeah. it with water and oh yeah i can totally you know, I can't get it here but I, my the raspberry flavored tag was my favorite oh i didn't even know there was such a thing i thought yeah only i was able was to get there. up there calorie <laughs> okay so some of us were spoiled up north we got the orange yeah. only <laughs> but when i went up there in 2021 they didn't have it they just had the regular tag so okay. oh well but i still okay. stuck with that <laughs> It's good. As warm. a just quickly, how many of you actually plant? You do gardens or you have plants and you look after them. Okay, great. That's that's really great to see. We need so much more of that. It's so important. And I am the plant killer. Sorry, but I am. I don't know why. Um, the only thing that seems to work for me is aloe vera. Grows great. I had a question on um, the research. Are is anyone and is I was trying to think if there is even a way how you would do it, but are people looking at the effects of gravity on the plants and is it looking at pressure inside of the plant cells or how how is it measured if they are looking at the effects of Yeah, so in terms gravity? of the research, I do know that they, they do do that because yes. Um, for example, our plants, when they were growing, they were visible to us on the ISS. We were able to check in and see that. And we saw the most interesting things. Now, here on Earth, our plants are growing straight up. Well, we could not believe it, but they were growing up and then they were suddenly going downward. And so that was a bit of a concern. The, the roots, is that's another thing we watch too. Are they going to grow down? Well, actually they went down and then they curved this way, coming back up again. So the studies and that I'm not familiar with, but mm -hmm. certainly we do notice there are some changes and impacts to the plant. Absolutely. Yeah. They probably experience Get freedom. <laughs> it's the freedom. Anywhere, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, our first group of plants, we were setting them up with a uh, cotton uh, swab inside. And mm -hmm. what would happen there is that 
you know, it was supposed to ground the seed and allow it to hold. Mm -hmm. And so the seed would be sitting on top, already germinated, and the root would start going down. Then we'd start to see it curling up and around the actual wow. cotton. Wow. Darlene? I'm thinking that because of the lack of gravity, that a plant will grow faster, would it not, in space, than it would be on Earth? Because gravity would come stunt things a little bit more. Is so, that correct? I I really don't know the answer to that. Because the thing is that if you think about all the different types of plants right now that are being grown on the ISS, to me, it's very much like being here on Earth. And I, and I could be wrong because you have to do the daily studies and looking at the plant and measuring their growth and and they're checking whatever you know soils or mediums they're in mm -hmm. the rate at which they would grow we would have to look at each of the individual types of plants that are being grown on the iss so tomatoes uh, lettuce um, kale things like that but that's a really good question darlene and i'm going to look into that but i'm also going to pose that to my students to go find because i All think right. that's something that's to good. know and then what would be the rate of these plants and their growth in a greenhouse on Mars? What's the rate of the plants growing here on Earth? So you've just opened up, opened up a whole area of inquiry for me to take back to my kids. All right, let's get Thank in. you. Jana, you're uh, muted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with the tomatoes, because you're talking about tomatoes, um, and then you were talking about how the, the plant would grow up, but then they would grow down, you know, and, and the roots or whatever. Um, here on Earth, we do also have the upside down tomatoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you guys tried doing that at, up in the... No. Would that work? So you have to remember when we're sending things up, they're in tubes. They're small. Um, oh. There's only so much room in the cargo hold. We're lucky if we can get two tubes on board. So we have not not tried that at all. I don't. I don't even think that's actually been tried on the ISS. Actually, maybe yes. Hydroponically, yes. I'm sure that that's happened. But okay. in terms of our system, no. Oh, I was just curious because you were talking about how gravity, you know, you were talking about the gravity and pulling it down. If yeah. And it could be two things, by the way. Yeah, it could be two things. It could be two. One, it could be the impact of, of the microgravity, but it could also be that our plants were dying. Right? Oh. And they're just literally drooping downward. So that we have to wait for results when they're returned to the lab and then the results come back to us. So that's something we wait for. I'm not really good with a whole lot of plants either, <laughs> but um, I am very good with squash. So if you okay. ever wish, squish and squish, I can grow that. <laughs> very cool. Thank very you, cool. Dana. Thank you. Well, Yolanda. Out of curiosity, do you know if NASA is doing anything with the uh, the food uh, 3D printing that they've been uh, working on? Did, did I hear food 3D printing? Yes. There's a group of scientists over in Europe that's been working on it, and they've actually had some really good success with it. So I've never heard of that. That's a new one for me. So they 3D <laughs> print their food? How it, does it's, that work? It's it works very similar to regular 3D printing. Um, it, it's in its initial stages, so I was just curious if NASA had started playing around with that or not. I have not heard of NASA doing that. I'm wondering if it's ESA that is more involved in something like that. Uh, the it's European, possible. Um, and that is something that I'm going to be super curious about right now. How are we 3D printing food? <laughs> Because that could certainly uh, save on my food bill in my house. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Yolanda. See, I, uh -huh. I love we get these opportunities to have these discussions because 
Remember, everything about what we do with Science Yourself is about inquiry. And what you're doing is you're throwing out questions. And these become the basis for which we will start to inquire even more now. And that's very exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Jane. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed hearing that. I don't have a question, but I am a teacher and uh, I just found it really inspiring. Kind of remind me like what, what's out there. Thank you, Jane. The and curriculum. thank you for being a teacher. Thank you for your service <laughs> in the most difficult times of education. Really appreciate that. Um, and hang in there yes. and just keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, we all had a teacher. Our first teachers were our, probably our parents, right? And then we all have some kind of teacher that inspired us to do more and become teachers. And that's anything we do. At some point, we can teach in some way. And I really think that I would never have been a teacher had I not had my first teacher. And that was my mother who basically said, when they tell you no, you tell them, watch me go. <laughs> so, thank you. Darlene. Darlene's on. Oh, I, I just figured out the raised hand thing. Um, I have a question for you about um, with all the, bo the body's fluids going towards the, the head and everything like that. I work as a dental assistant and I always was wondering how um astronauts deal with their oral health in um in space on the space station and as are, are there is a lot more are there a lot more bacteria in their mouth do they have to do a lot more extra care to take care of their their teeth not extra care no darling that's a really good question so toothpaste on the international space station is edible ours is not okay so there's no sink to spit in it's not there um, yeah you can't sort of you know take your water and sip it and then just out in the international space station so unless you're going to actually drink it right back in again so they do brush your teeth regularly and remember hygiene health care all of that begins on earth this is all part of their training and then they must keep it up while they're in space. So they are very hypersensitive to their personal needs. It's, it's important that they stay healthy. It's not like they can call an ambulance and have somebody run on up there. So right. when they're brushing their teeth, they are using toothpaste, they put it on their brush, they brush their teeth, they gulp it down and away they go. So I've not heard, I've not heard of anybody having any kind of dental issues um okay. yeah in terms of I, the astronauts I guess that's one because you know with um if they suddenly had tooth pain you know because they well obviously you're taking care of their teeth and everything but if there's something that was underlying that was that they wouldn't have known about until they got into space and all this extra um lack of gravity and everything would change the way the the teeth sit in the patients of the person's mouth so that's what i was wondering mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. good it's good to wonder about the, yeah. that sort of thing too and when you think about it if for any reason there were any kind of dental issues that that would have been picked up before they left yeah. you know they, okay. they are x-rayed and checked and double checked <laughs> and they're not you know we don't let our children leave the house without making sure they have everything and checking everything. <laughs> um, it's worse for them. Okay. <laughs> it's way sure. worse for them. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it's been right. awesome. Awesome to be with you all. And uh, whatever you're doing, keep on inspiring people out there and sharing your stories because they're important. And again, they may not look like they're listening, but they are. <laughs>